Hello class. Today we're going to be covering chapter 10, which covers the institutionalization of youth, looking at both short-term and long-term placements. So let's get into today's lesson. The learning objectives for this lesson are that by the end, you should be able to describe the purpose and operation of both short-term confinement and long-term juvenile correctional facilities, to describe the goals, purpose, and operation of training schools, summarize the various rights that juveniles have when they're institutionalized, as well as summarize the factors that should be taken into account when we're implementing policies in confinement for juveniles. So looking at short-term confinement, the first one we have is jails. So we know that jails, there's a lot of overcrowding in these facilities. There's the potential for juveniles to be sexually victimized. They have increased rates of suicide when they're in jails. And then we have the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act of 1974 that actually required states to remove juveniles from adult jails and lockups by 1989. They have not been completely removed up until today, um, but most youth have been moved into detention facilities specifically for juvenile offenders, and we'll cover that on the next slide. It's interesting to note, though, that in these two graphs here, so in 2006, there were over 6,000 youth under the age of 18 being held in adult jails. In 2004, so looking at just two years prior, 87% of jail inmates that were under the age of 18 were being held as adults, which we covered in one of our previous chapters. So those youth who were being charged and tried as adults. There's this belief, however, that simply just separating juveniles from adults in jails is sufficient to protect them from the negative effects of jail confinement. This belief is not true. So let's look at short-term confinements of juvenile detention centers as well as shelter care facilities. So detention centers, as I said before, are an alternative to jail for youth. It's simply supposed to be a temporary holding facility for juvenile offenders, and they're not to spend long time here. 50% of these detention centers don't offer any treatment programs. Again, because they're temporary and they're not training schools, they're not long-term. So it's, it's very difficult for them to offer treatment because they're not gonna have the youth there long enough to complete a program. Most do, however, offer education so that youth, when they're being pulled from their home schools and placed in a detention center, they can continue with their education and they don't lose credits. We have this idea, though, in Boulder, Colorado, of attention homes rather than detention. So the idea behind these are that they would give youth attention rather than just focusing on the detention of youth. So they focused on programming and they actually encouraged interaction between staff and the residents, whereas in most detention centers, they do not promote this. And then we have shelter care facilities. So these are, were specifically created for dependent and neglected youth because the JJDPA mandated that non-criminal youth be placed in facilities separate from criminal or delinquent youth. So they have in these facilities, just dependent and neglected youth. However, dependent youth, I'm sorry, delinquent youth can be placed in there under certain circumstances. It has to be that the child is not continually displaying delinquent behaviors, but is displaying more dependent behaviors. So in these shelters facilities, there's a lot more room for the youth to get out of the facility. So they'll do things such as home visits here, They'll take community trips out into various events in the community. They might even go out and do community service. The issue, though, is that they have a lot of runaways because they're not as secure as detention facilities are. So again, I know we're focusing on juvenile justice and more of the delinquency side. So this is something that has to be taken into account. If you are going to recommend that a delinquent youth be placed in shelter, you have to show that they don't need the extra secure confinement. An example of this I can give you is that I had one youth who was on probation with me. He started out as a very low level on a consent decree. He continually violated his probation and ultimately ended up on, well, I'm sorry, he violated his consent decree and ultimately ended up on probation supervision with me. During the time he was on supervision, he did get detained by myself for various violations, testing positive for marijuana, just leaving the home, being unaccounted for. 
And while he was in detention, his mother actually overdosed and passed away. Now, he had no family to be released to, and his dad was not in the picture. So we decided that we would move him into our shelter because his behaviors were really more dependent issues at that point. And we looked to get our Office of Children and Youth involved and to find more of a group home placement for him. So that's an example where, because of his circumstances, we moved him into the shelter side so that he could have a little more freedoms and because we knew he was going to be spending a little bit more time there than we originally anticipated while we looked for a different type of programming for him. So let's look at some long-term confinement facilities. So these are things such as boot camps, which are going to give shock treatment, and they emphasize a military-type discipline. <clears throat> you have reception and diagnostic centers, where they're going to give youth evaluations, and they're going to determine the best type of placement facility for that child. Then you have ranches and forestry camps. So these are typically minimum security facilities with survival or outdoor components. And then you have training centers and schools. These are going to be your longer term facilities and more secure institutional stays. So let's take each one of these individually. So boot camps, they focus on physical training and regimented activities. So they're going to have drill instructors that are running these programs. The typical stay is about 30 days to 120 days, and they're going to be for your moderate risk offenders. So typically we're not going to place any low risk offenders in any type of institutional setting. So there's a group punishment as well in boot camp. So they focus on, say, if one person is not following the rules, you punish the group, which is what they do in the military, to get that person up to the level of the rest of the, the unit. And the good programs are going to be individualized and tailored to the spe specific types of youth that they have. So they're going to have things such as job training, opportunities for community service, substance abuse counseling, mental health care, as well as intensive aftercare services. Again, we want to make sure that we're following up with these youth when they're released from these facilities to ensure that they're retaining what they were taught during that boot camp. Unfortunately, recidivism rates are typically higher or just the same as any other types of confinement that a youth is committed to. So if we're seeing higher recidivism rates, we really don't want to be placing youth in boot camp type facilities. There have also been a number of youth who have died at boot camp style facilities. Specifically, it was found that it was due to a lot of ineffective management, as well as reckless and negligent behavior on behalf of the staff. So let's get into reception and diagnostic centers. So in these centers, a youth is gonna typically go for roughly four to six weeks, and they're gonna help determine the best treatment plan for that youth. So they're gonna identify the appropriate training center they maybe should go to. They're gonna have the youth assessed by a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker. They'll begin be given physical as well as mental health examinations. And it's a dormitory type stay that the youth are gonna stay in for this time period. And then the dormitory staff are actually going to assess the youth and how they're interacting with their peers, how they're adjusting to the programming, and things like that to really see the personal side of the youth. So at these centers, the youth will actually be given a full treatment plan, and that should go with them to the next facility they're placed at. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as your book notes, most times the youth have to go through all of those same processes again, when they are sent to a new facility because they have their own assessments and their own psychologists, their own social workers that they're going to want to assess that child as well. So a lot of times youth have to go through roughly similar to the whole process again. So we have ranches and forestry camps. So these are going to be for your more minor offenses or for youth who are committed to a state department of youth services. So in Pennsylvania, we have what's called youth forestry camp number three and number two. One of those is more of a secure confinement, and one of them is for a drug and alcohol. So these focus on a lot of conservation work. They'll have the youth do landscaping or general maintenance. At one of our youth forestry camps, they do a lot of things outdoors. They'll do wood cutting. Youth will also have individual meetings with a social worker on site. They'll attend things such as group therapy. They may even go out to different community events. They should be given home passes when they're getting close 
to being discharged so that we can acclimate them back into their home communities. And they do focus on staff relationships with youth and they want them to build those relationships so that they can help in the behavior change of the youth. So now we'll get into training schools. <clears throat> training schools, they have three different goals, or they can have three different goals. One, they can focus on obedience and conformity. So these types of training schools are really gonna emphasize surveillance and rules. So making sure that they know where youth are at all times and making sure that they're not having any infractions, they're following all the rules of that facility. And these are just very punitive types of schools. You can then have re-education and development type schools where the goal is to teach the youth hard work, to have them grow intellectually, and they typically offer rewards for conformity rather than punishing for conformity, or I'm sorry, punishing for non-conformity. So they focus on the positives. And again, these facilities are gonna want staff interactions with residents. They're gonna want relationships built between the staff and the youth so that they can again, assist better in behavior change because they're gonna have trust between the two. And then the, your final goal is treatment. This is where staff are going to work with they're gonna help, as well as permit residents to be more emotionally connected to them. So in the previous type of facility, they're gonna have relationships with the residents, but in the treatment uh, type, they're really gonna focus on the, that relationship building, focusing on boundaries, on trust, and really working one-on-one -on -one with those youth. So there's three different levels of security that these schools typically have. You can have minimum security, where youth may be locked in their rooms to sleep at night or when they're being out of control, but otherwise it's an open type campus. They're typically cottages that have a home-like feel. Then you can have medium security. So these are gonna be more of your dormitories or it could still be your cottage type. And they're gonna have a, typically a perimeter fence, security fence, which you see in the photo here. They can have barbed wire or they don't have to have barbed wire. Um, we have one facility in Pennsylvania where it's a regular, I would say, medium training school. And then within that, there's actually a maximum security um, training school, which has another layer of double wired fence just like this around it. So it's extra secure. Uh, so in your maximum security, you're going to have all the doors, doors are typically going to be locked where you have to unlock the door to get into one section and it locks behind you before you can open the next. Cells are going to typically have screens or bars on them. And again, you're having cells in these maximum security facilities rather than the minimum and medium security, which are going to be more of like a dormitory style or a cottage. When I say cottage, just think of like a home where you have maybe one big building and you have various rooms within that building and a common area. So it's really going to feel more like a, like a, a college dorm room. And then again, in the maximum security, you're going to have those perimeter fences as well. So what types of programming is going to be offered at these training schools? We are typically going to have educational programming because, again, we need to make sure all of our youth are graduating from school. <clears throat> They'll typically offer basic skills such as reading, writing, and arithmetic. There's a lot that offer different vocations so that youth can earn certificates and things like OSHA. They can get their forklift license. They can get their um, certificates in carpentry, auto repair. A lot of them are offer barbering, and for females, maybe things such as beauty care or beauticians. And then they, a lot of them offer competitive sports. So if you ever have time, look up Rite of Passage. They have schools in Maryland, in Arizona. Um, I believe there's one in Florida and Ohio. The one in um, Arizona specifically, it looks like a college campus and their football team is amazing and they actually compete against other schools in the area because they have their own school system so you can also offer things such as basketball there's a lot of volleyball and softball <clears throat> and then we want to give youth recreational activities so we want to make sure that they're still getting to be kids at the end of the day so they'll watch things such as movies they might do arts i'm not saying crafts but they might do arts with them painting um, different projects and then a big one too is decorating the cottages so just to give the youth again that home-like feel to make them feel that they're not in this institution they're going to let them decorate the cottages and a lot of places they will actually have 
like decorating um, competitions and they'll decorate their cottage and then they'll have the staff say or the director of the program come down and vote for which one was the best. They might let the kids play pool, checkers, or chess. A lot of these facilities have family rooms or recreational rooms where they have all of these things and all these activities. And when family come to visit, they'll typically use these rooms for the families to conduct their, um, to have their visits with the kids. Some places also offer religious instruction and services. They give the youth the opportunity, um, whether it's no matter what denomination you are, they usually give them the opportunity to still follow their faith. And then they're offered treatment. So you want to focus on psychotherapy, a lot of behavior modification, <clears throat> guided group interactions, as well as drug and alcohol, and cognitive behavioral interventions. Not all of these are going to be offered at every training school, but you're going to have at least one of them. And then youth must be given day and weekend passes. And I'm putting this under programs specifically because it's important that youth get to go out with their families on day passes to see how they're going to interact with them and how they're to, to get them to practice what they've been learning while they're at the training school. And then weekend passes will actually be given to be able to go home for the weekend and again, practice those skills, but now in their home setting. And then they'll come back and they'll debrief with staff and talk about how it went. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about operations within these training schools. So what does a typical day look like? Well, first off, they've started replacing the words cottage parents, which is what they used to be referred to, with names such as youth supervisors, youth leaders, <clears throat> cottage supervisors, group supervisors, and group care workers. They changed the name because they felt that cottage parents was just not an appropriate term for these staff members. So these staff members are going to be responsible for things such as waking the residents up in the morning, making sure that they're supervising their hygiene activities, as well as the meal times. In some facilities, the youth will actually prepare their own meals or help staff prepare meals. They'll be responsible for escorting the students to class, to their various groups, if they attend therapy, and they may even take them to their jobs that they hold in the community or different community events. But they're also going to be asked to intervene when residents have conflicts and to respond to emergencies that occur. So they all have to be trained on safe restraints and different tactics to de-escalate youth who are <clears throat> in an emergency or a crisis um, state. They may be asked to search the living quarters of youth to make sure there's no contraband, as well as for personal and institutional advisement. And by that I mean they might be asked to just sit and talk with a youth, just get to know them and build that relationship. Typically structured after school time is when youth are going to engage in their groups, in their therapy, and then they might be given a short period of time for recreation or other organized activities, such as going outside and playing basketball, doing a pickup game, things like that. But it's very important in these institutions that they typically like to keep their entire day as structured as possible because it doesn't give youth then the opportunity or gives them less of an opportunity to be getting in trouble. So what are a few issues that we have within institutionalization of youth? The first one is going to be victimization. This is defined as a predatory practice whereby inmates that have a superior strength and knowledge prey on those who are weaker. <clears throat> and this can happen in juvenile institutions, and it does happen in juvenile institutions. They can be uh, seen through physical assaults, sexual assaults, even just emotional and psychological um, I'm not going to call them tortures, but essentially bullying, and then exploitation. So maybe asking a youth to bring contraband into the facility because they think that they're going to, they'll be able to get away with it, or they're going to tell them that if you don't bring this in, then I'm going to inflict physical pain on you. And then we have disproportionate minority confinement. So this is when we have individuals who are belonging to a minority group being involved with the justice system at higher rates than white um, individuals are. 
Act, the JJDPA actually mandated that states reduce the number of minority youth that they had confined in institutions because they realized that this was an issue, and it still is an issue today. Typically, minorities make up a greater portion of the juvenile and criminal justice system than they do of the general population. So what rights does a youth have when they're institutionalized? There are three main rights. You're going to want to remember these. The first is going to be the right to treatment. So when they're in an institution and they're committed to an institution, they have the right to treatment because it provides for rehabilitation. A youth cannot be, not be denied access to treatment. They also have the right to have access to the courts and to refuse treatment. So they're allowed to petition courts for relief from an earlier judicial decision. So if they don't agree with the decision that the judge made, they're allowed to petition the court and they can voluntarily refuse treatment except in three circumstances. And those are when services are legally obligated, things such as attending school, when services are there to prevent a clear harm to their physical health, or when services are mandated by the court as a condition of their non-residential disposition. The third is going to be that youth have the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment, just as adults do. So this forbids the use of corporal punishment in a lot of juvenile institutions. A lot of institutions are also not able to use medications for control. And by that, I mean things such as tranquilizers for youth who are out of control. They can't just simply sedate them with medication to gain compliance. <clears throat> and a lot of institutions don't allow for extended periods of solitary confinement, which is what you're actually going to be focusing on in your written assignment for this week. So when we're talking about confinement policies, we're talking about policies for institutional confinement. So any of those long-term facilities that we mentioned, and even detention centers. So you want to have, what do you want to include when you have one of these policies? Well, first and foremost, youth should be kept as close to home as possible. So that way family can visit. Remember those day and weekend passes I talked about. We want to make sure that the family is able to be involved to whatever level they're able and are willing to be involved so that when the youth is returned to their communities, they still have those strong relationships. Facilities should remain small. So they say that detention populations should be no more than 30 youth and training school populations should be no more than 50. They should be pleasantly furnished. So just have basic furnishings. Make sure that you have you know, nice looking couches, that things don't look run down and beaten down. They should be clean and orderly and have some type of security feature, whether that's locked doors or you have some staff secure facilities where doors are not locked, but they're staff secure because there's staff there 24 seven to ensure the safety of the youth. Again, you should have adequate staffing and programming. So offer enough staff so that they can make sure they're keeping an eye on all of the kids and also offer them enough programming so that we can rehabilitate the youth. And then you have professional and well-trained staff. I can't tell you how many times we have seen incidents happen at our facilities that we have youth placed at. And typically, if it's handled in the wrong way, it's usually because the staff was not properly trained or they don't have the proper credentials. It's very hard though to get highly trained and highly qualified staff at these facilities because they do not pay well. Not sure what the going rate is now, but last time I looked, it was around 13 to $15 an hour. And that's with a bachelor's degree where you're dealing with youth who are physically aggressive, youth who are acting out, and you're dealing with a lot of nonsense for only $15 an hour. And then they note that you should have satisfactory physical safety plans. So again, if a youth does need to be restrained, make sure that you have the proper plan in place for how that's to occur. Make sure you know what to do and staff knows what to do if an incident, an emergency incident happens. And then utilize community resources. So you don't want to just keep a youth, I mean, in some facilities you have to, the more maximum secure facilities. But be able to get the youth out into their communities where the facility is or even bring in volunteers, which your book talks about 
at length using volunteers inside the facility to really get the community involved and to help have them help support the next generation of youth. So in sum, we have detention centers, jails, and shelters as short-term holding facilities for youth. Shelters were actually created for dependent and neglected youth originally, although delinquent youth can be placed in them. Boot camps, reception and diagnostic centers, ranches and forestry camps, and training centers, or also called training schools, are long-term facilities for juvenile delinquents. Training schools can vary in their goals, the types of programming that they offer, as well as the security levels. Remember, there's minimum, maximum, and medium security. Juveniles have three rights when they're institutionalized. So they have the right to be given treatment while they're institutionalized. They have the right to access the courts as well as refuse treatment if they don't want it and the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment and lastly it's important for confinement policy to include proper staff take into account safety and rehabilitation of the youth and the physical appearance of the facility when they're creating their policies 